Greetings, everybody. Welcome to Macro Talk 2. It is Thursday, March the... There's a half a one and maybe a four. So is it the 14th? I write it down in the morning so I don't forget and then I forget. Uh, I think it's the 14th. Welcome to Macro Talk 2. Today we're talking about buying bugs and and a, a lot more than that. It kind of led me down a bit of a rabbit hole and uh, I'm going to talk about a few of the things that are going on. Big picture things with, uh, with insects and uh, us getting a hold of them. Uh, sound is good, thank goodness. Uh, I did solve the problem uh, from Tuesday. I figured out what it was. It's just a, a, a rubbish cable that I was using um, for the wireless. I since tested it with a, um, a, a different kind of XLR adapter thing where I use the wireless mic instead of this mic and it actually works very well. But I didn't have the adapter available to, to do it, so I've ordered one. By, hopefully by Tuesday we can finish up what we started. Uh, unbelievably, the bugs are still sitting there, the camera's still looking at them. It hasn't moved since Tuesday, so uh, I, I don't want to... Um, uh, lose this opportunity so we may be cleaning eyes on Tuesday just uh, just saying so got a couple of things to talk about before we start we have um, a busy weekend uh, if you're a Patreon member we have a, a, a presume to end all presumes on Saturday not really it's just a presume uh, but it is on Saturday Saturday morning it's going to be a good one and it's going to be potentially my last one for a couple of weeks um, well, it's always my last one for a couple of weeks, isn't it? It might be my last one for a couple of more weeks. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to, to do a live presume from the road. Uh, depends on travel plans, but uh, I'll, I'll say more about that on Saturday. That's on Saturday morning, two hours, and we've got a really special show lined up for you because we're uh, going to be talking to our guinea pig a beginner extreme macro enthusiast uh, who's going to be reporting back on the first six weeks of boot camp and uh, that's going to be interesting. I, I for one will be very nervous uh, watching that as I get my report card and then um, uh, we have several other things we're going to cover then right after that at 12.30 we have the tangent. Larry Strunk and I will be doing the 3D modeling uh, uh, get together that's a lot of fun and it's it, we're going to be bringing it back into the photography realm with our next uh, thingamajig that we're doing. Um, I, I can't tell you what it is because I haven't talked to Larry about it yet. And, uh, well, it's up to him really, isn't it? But uh, I am going to show you my drawing because I'm proud of it. I've got to get it up there on the thingamajig. But look at this. I did this myself. That's my draw divider. How about that? I made that in about 10 minutes last night. As soon as Larry told me what I was doing wrong, it turned out to be quite easy. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to make draw dividers for all my drawers, uh, and they'll get better with each one. But anyway, if you want to come on Saturday, that's the kind of thing we do. We, we learn how to do that and uh, talk about it and compare notes and laugh a good bit as well. So it's good fun. 12.30. It's free. Uh, it's available to anybody who has the least bit of interest. Uh, go to my website, go to the most recent blog post, and you will find a link that you can click on if you want to join us. I went to my camera club last night, um, as, I, as I do. A um, friend of the show, Bill Wheeler, puts this, this shindig on every month, and uh, it's got quite a few uh, luminaries uh, in attendance, and it's a really fun group. It's a very, very talented group of photographers. Uh, based in the top left-hand corner of America, and um, last night one of the one of the guys uh, who, who knows who he is was showing some pictures that I found inspiring. Uh, I've never done crystal photography, but this morning I just went on a wild tear and I ordered anything I could think of that would crystallize. And we're going to do that uh, when I get back from my trip. Uh, we're going to so get ready to order some crystals and some bits of glass and polarizer stuff because we're going to be doing some uh, crystal photography. Not, it's not the kind of crystals you hang around your neck to ward off uh, herpes or whatever it is you use them for. It's um, the kind you look at with the microscope and take pictures of. I'm excited. I've always wanted to do that. Well, I've done it once before, but it didn't really work out well. The crystals look more like sludge, but I think we'll get it right this time. So that's, that's going to be fun. 
And uh, thanks so much to Henry for giving me that idea. All right, so um, good news, bad news, uh, depending, depending on your point of view, I'll start with one of them, uh, either the good news or the bad news, is I'm going to be gone for three consecutive live streams after next week. So next week's normal, Tuesday, Thursday, and then I'll be gone for three. So, so a Tuesday, then a Thursday, then a Tuesday. So I'll be back on like the 4th of April. That's when our next live stream will be. So that's the, either the good news or the bad news. If you hate this live stream, it's the good news. Um, but the, uh, the other news is that uh, I went out and recorded a video yesterday, which is um, a, a pretty different kind of video for me. And um, yeah, that's all I'm going to say about it. But uh, it'll be coming out while I'm gone. Um, I'll probably uh, put it out on the Tuesday or Wednesday while I'm gone. So um, that will just show up. I'll try to put it on at the same time in the evening. So if you forget that we don't have this, then you can just pop over there and watch the video. Okay, so uh, that's that. And um, hmm, yeah, I was. it looks like from my notes that I was going to actually tell you more about that, but I'm not going to. Um, the week after I get back, we have a very special guest at the the uh, Pazoom meeting that weekend, um, and it's it's a, a reason for anybody who's at all interested in where art and AI collide. Uh, this is one of the the world's most uh, authoritative leaders in that area. Uh, he's an AI artist as well as a, a composer of music and a specialist photographer of some repute, and uh, he's a super nice guy. He's funny. He's clever. Uh, he, he puts on a great talk, and uh, he's going to come and uh, meet with us uh, at the uh, Pazoom meeting on the, um, gosh, 13th? I think so. Saturday the 13th. It's an unlucky Saturday, that. Saturday the 13th, I think. Or is that Friday? Yeah, it could be. But anyway, um, um, he'll be with us. Dennis H. Miller is his name. Look him up if, uh, if you've never heard of him, and you'll be blown away by his art. And uh, that's what he's going to be talking about. I can't wait to have him on. I mean, uh, a lot of you already know him, but um, he's a good guy. So um, people have been making fun of this whole idea of, of a, me wearing a T-shirt that says I got it at a thrift shop. But ever since that uh, discussion came up, I've noticed myself saying that an awful lot. I'm about to say it again, um, just once, no, twice. See my, my new fairy lights around the um, table? That's the first three feet of, uh, of my most recent um, LED find. It's a solar-powered LED thing, but I cut the solar power thing off because it wasn't working, and I just put batteries on it, and it works fine. But that wasn't what I wanted to show you. Look what I got for $12. $12. You're right, it's a bag of human limbs. No, it's a, um, it's a bag that contains three, count them, three studio flashes. They're from Promaster. They're not very good, I imagine, but um, there's three of them. And um, a backup flash system, that's not bad for $12. They all work. I plugged them in, they all flash, and they're, they're quite powerful. They're like 600 million watts or something like that. So uh, that's the latest find. You can laugh at me all you want, but you tell me when you bought three studio lights for $12 then you'll, you'll be a believer. Um, anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. I got it at a thrift shop. So um, I want to tell you one very brief story because we were mentioning AI a minute ago because it, this really creeped me out. I was talking to ChatGPT last night. I was asking a question um, uh, about a completely separate matter and it occurred to me because of the problem I'd been having with the microphone. I said... I said, um, she, she has a name now, by the way, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. 
and and uh, I said uh, I've been having a problem with my microphone, and um, uh, it's it's the wireless microphone, and I told her what kind it was, and um, I said you got any ideas of why it sounds so bad? And she came back on and said it's probably your cable. Do this to test it. And, and she just went into the most incredible detail about the plugs that are available on my Audient uh, preamp. And she said, you can modify one of those plugs for a TRS. And if you jump it to a such and such, and uh, you should have all that stuff around the, the studio. Unbelievable. It was like very creepy because we'd been talking about something geopolitical. And all of a sudden she becomes a sound engineer. It's really bizarre. I do enjoy it, though. It's kind of a, a great way to learn stuff. All right, so I, that's all of the chitter-chatter I had to uh, do. Does anybody have any burning questions that need to be addressed before we get started? This is going to be just a little bit on the, the dry side, but that is on purpose because it's important stuff. Uh, but uh, nope, nobody's got anything. We're okay on the uh, mic and um, we're good to go. Okay, good. So uh, what we're talking about is we're revisiting bugs. You know, it's, it, can you believe how long it's been since the bug study was completed? I don't know how long it was, but I know it's longer than I think it is, so it's uh, probably a while ago. But the fact is, I've had a couple of recent experiences that have been a, a little bit bothersome, and it caused me to think, you know, this is a very volatile business. Maybe it's time I revisited and uh, literally revisited all of my um, the, the shops that I'd dealt with before and uh, checked in on everybody and saw what they were up to and checked some prices for, for comparable uh, orders and that the, the, the same basic research that I did for the first one, plus some other things and talked to some people. I also signed up for a couple of, uh, of interesting uh, groups online uh, forums uh, in entomology and uh, insect collectors, other places where a, a lot of buying and selling of insects goes on, and uh, started seeing some interesting trends. So what I want to talk about today is kind of the state of the business and what it means for us uh, insect photographers. Now, I know that I'm uh, right away uh, cutting half of you out of the conversation who don't like to photograph insects but this very quickly gets much more important than just getting insects to photograph them we will loop back to that but um, uh, I've got some new recommendations that I think will be helpful to you if you're ever in the in the market to, to buy an insect to photograph the, uh, the the business appears to be less stable than it was uh, we'll say a year and a half ago when, when the study started, though it might have been two years ago now. But the, the uh, business is, is really very volatile. It is so dependent on local sourcing of bugs, but also on things like pressure that is being brought to bear by governments and, uh, and other influential bodies uh, who have some real issues with the way uh, any uh, live uh, animals are being captured and um, and dispatched. The Convention on International Agreements uh, of Endangered Species and Wild Fauna, that, that uh, group of folks um, are really getting uh, pretty heavy-handed in, in uh, clamping down on, on the sale of, of uh, insects that are endangered, that type of thing. The result is that, that all insects have, have gotten significantly more expensive. And you can see it uh, domestically uh, as well as internationally. It doesn't just show up as the bugs being more costly, which they are, but they appear to be fewer. There's less selection. Now, I understand that this is a snapshot in time and it's a fairly subjective way of looking at, uh, at the business because I haven't been sitting here looking at it every week for the, the last year and a half. Uh, but when I go back and take a close look, it, it seems like my order from um, my orders, I should say, uh, from Europe um, took a lot longer to complete because there were far fewer options available. Um, I've also noticed that uh, in, in addition to being more expensive and um, 
uh, more rare. Uh, the insects that I have been seeing are smaller and they don't look uh, as, as healthy. Now, again, th this may well be, you could discount it if it was just me saying it, because one order, even a big order like I, I made uh, a few weeks ago, is not going to be able to assess the whole business, one order from one vendor. But in reading the forums that, that I've joined, a lot of other people are mentioning this, this type of observation, that uh, uh, bugs are getting smaller and, and uh, they're, they're more delicate than they, they were. They're, now, this could well be a matter of local sourcing over harvesting of certain uh, things in certain locations could lead them to, to, to be snagging smaller subjects. I don't know. Uh, but it, it caused me to, to at least consider the option of uh, maybe re-emphasizing the way I've always done it, which is to source my own insects locally. It's not too difficult uh, to do. Um, it takes learning a few tricks of, of the trade and making a few little bits of equipment, and then having a, a good routine for, for managing the, uh, the, the subjects that you catch and to get them ready for, for uh, photography. But it gives you a lot of control um, over what's happening in, in the environment, and in, particularly in your environment, because you, know, you just don't take insects that you don't need, that you, you aren't going to photograph. Now, there are some of the techniques that, that I use that uh, don't leave that option open. When I'm using a sweet net at night to, to catch small and tiny, tiny small insects, there's, there's a lot of by-kill in doing that, I, I will admit. But it's usually mosquitoes, um, the stingy kind. So, um, yeah, there, there, there is a lot to be said for taking control of the insect uh, hunting activities yourself. If you, if you want a weevil, you can go out and uh, I'll tell you the bush to go to uh, in my town and you can harvest two or three beautiful clown weevils. Uh, but you leave the rest alone and let them go on and do their thing. And, and um, providing yeah, you, you don't subscribe to them having like uh, a big social group that was going to miss them, then uh, you're, you're probably okay. But I'm not making light of that. That is an issue. That really is an issue. I don't like killing bugs um, at all, but it is a necessary evil. And um, certainly what we do, what we do by talking about in, uh, insects and, and by showing people, showing the world how beautiful and, and, and complicated the, the whole ecosystem is, we're doing a big good that nobody else would be doing. Uh, so, uh, you know, photographing and showing those photographs and making people aware of just how spectacular our, 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 our ecosystem is and how delicate it is, is a very, very important role that we should take very seriously. Um, and that, again, uh, circles back around to, to the question of um, of, uh, of uh, harvesting insects uh, uh, commercially. So, as I was thinking about this, I start. I, you could, you can't help but think about the cycle of extinctions that we've been through on this planet. Uh, we're in, we're in what's called the sixth cycle. Um, that makes it sound a little bit like a, an opera from Wagner, doesn't it? But it's the the um, the, the planet has undergone wholesale extinctions on five previous occasions. In every one of those occasions, it was caused by some catastrophic, cataclysmic event that made life on the, the surface of the planet just about impossible, and everything died. Um, and these things happen cyclically on planets like ours. And the one that we're seeing now is altogether different because this is self-inflicted to a degree, probably a large degree. And talking about the, the impact that uh, uh, an extinction, an early in the process of an extinction, uh, extinction is going to have on insect populations, and in turn, what the insect decline is going to impact the rest of us with, the rest of the planet, is worth 
pausing to think about for a minute. But before we get to that truly heavy topic, let's talk for just a minute about the factors that are probably uh, influencing this this uh, um, kind of tightening market for, for bugs. Hi higher prices, poorer selection, uh, poorer bugs in general. Uh, it's probably a mixture of several things, uh, and I think conservation and the legislation around it is probably at the top of the list. What countries are doing uh, in response to outcries uh, about um, uh, what I just described uh, with the uh, extinction. So there are a lot of ethical trading practices that are enforced now that weren't enforced before. Uh, and in the at attempt to curtail the sale of, of endangered species, we're now somewhat curtailing the sale of all species because that's an uh, an unavoidable byproduct of having strict re uh, legislation for one class of insects. They all get kind of caught up in the same net, so to speak. But they, um, the, the curbing the trade in the endangered species is something nobody could disagree with. No rational person could disagree with. And knowing where the line is is where the problem is. And uh, just the the uh, overreaction, possibly, or uh, just the the, the strict um, reaction to it, may be a factor. Uh, there is an increased demand, actually, for live insects from science and industry in, in a way that hasn't been seen before. Uh, science is using a, a, a lot more, and I learned this from talking to entomologists, they're using a lot more insects than they used to, and they're sourcing them uh, you know, from big commercial companies. A lot of those are, are uh, farmed, so uh, that offsets a little bit of the impact um, to the uh, environment. But also, um, the, uh, uh, th that is a, a stable corner of the market. It's like universities are buying, they have fixed orders, so they're getting the same thing all the time. It helps to hold the market together. People like me, I'll place an order. We placed an order for a few hundred dollars a couple of months ago, and then I won't order anything for a year. And that does not help the stability of the market. And we're, we are considered the hobbyist market, and we, we take up less than 1% of the, of the global trade in insects. The largest part of the trade is food. Yeah, uh, food protein for livestock and and uh, increasingly for um, uh, non-livestock as in like human beings so um, yeah uh, they are exclusively raised um, on on farms so um, that that it, it probably doesn't have a direct impact but it, it may have a secondary knock-on effect in in how insects are, are available to purchase for us and then um the, the new uh, methods that they have for breeding and cultivation of insects have greatly improved the, the, the uh, ability to create biomass. But, you know, we're still losing biomass at an alarming rate, even though we're, we're growing healthier commercial insects. Um, we're, not, we're not replacing them as fast as they're dying out, and we're certainly not replacing species that are dying out. Um, regional trends also make this a very unstable business uh, because all it takes is one crazy dictator to, to get into power in, in a, an important uh, a corner of uh, Africa, say, and all of a sudden you're not getting any insects from that quarter of the country because everything gets disrupted. So uh, these, these things, as well as just the trends on, on you know, whether or not the people who are hunting these insects for us can, can make a living doing it. They go out of business and the price of the rest of the insects goes up. You know all of this. But um, it, a few of the markets that we trade in, especially in the, in the Far East, are, are more um, interested in raising insects for, for their own commercial use, for medications, for example, and other things. Uh, flavorings for drinks and that makes them more available to us because th they consider that crucial to their to their economy so 
there, there's a lot going on, is what I'm trying to say. It's a it's a, a volatile and iffy business. But you know what's not volatile is grabbing the net and heading to the pond in in the evening. And um, you know, winter always does this to me. But I, I, by the time winter's over, I'm thinking, well, life without insects isn't any fun. Um, but they come back, and uh, they have come back now. Just since the uh, the clocks changed last weekend, I've been out twice uh, of an evening uh, and took the net uh, the last time, and uh, didn't actually bring anything back. But because uh, all I saw were pollinators, but. Um, you know, there really is a lot to be said for for uh, incorporating that part into your photography. It gives you a sense of um, ownership and pride in the uh, images uh, that uh, you don't get when you buy them. I promise you, you don't. Um, by the way, I almost didn't make the beginning of this um, this uh, uh, live stream because somebody knocked on my door. It was a big man probably the biggest man I've ever seen uh, is about nine feet tall and he was carrying a box that I could only move four inches inside the house it is big enough to have a body in it if it's crouched down I have not ordered anything and I would have known if I'd ordered something the size of a body that weighed a hundred pounds so I'm, I'm intrigued to see what's in this box so if I appear distracted, it's because I'm looking at it to make sure that nothing is trying to climb out. Um, so there you go. Um, let's um, uh, let, let's uh, talk in uh, about the um, the the forums. In fact, I'll tell you what would be would be better. I'll just I will list the forums that I've joined, and um, you can look at them and see if that's something that would be of any interest to you. But it's going to tie into my recommendations at the end uh, as to how you go about um, sourcing your bugs. If you're going to con if you're going to continue to buy them, I'm going to give you some advice on how to do that in a way that's going to consistently save you money and get you better bugs because I'm just now discovering it, but it, it makes perfect sense. So um, what we didn't talk about uh, was the, the actual impact of the climate, pre predominantly the climate, but really environmental factors in general are having on insect populations, but we've got to talk about that. In fact, it's one of the, the, the few socially responsible things that I will stick my neck out and do because we've got to. We've got to because nobody else seems to be paying a whole lot of attention to it. Um, that's obviously not true. There are organizations and great people the world over who are busting their cans to, to do something about this. But this is our survival we're talking about. When we talk about climate change that's impacting insect populations, we are talking about something that is only a handful of years ahead of the kind of impact that, that, that is going to be noticed by us. We're already noticing a lot of it, as, as you're going to see. But uh, climate change, uh, and uh, particularly the, the climate change that, that we've seen uh, in recent decades is um, a, a large part of what is fueling this extinction uh, because the, the rising temperatures uh, with the, the, the lack of our ability to auto-regulate our temperature um, are, are just changing the rate at which insects develop. They, they develop too quickly uh, in warmer environments and they get, end up getting harvested when they're much smaller. Um, and they're less hardy, uh, they, they uh, compete for more food in, in a smaller uh, area. Warmer conditions do lead to small insects, that's, that's known. It also leads to the bigger insects, but they're the, 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 the you know, apex predator insects. The rest of them are, are pretty much, um, there is a temperature size uh, uh, rule of thumb uh, in ectotherms, which includes insects and uh, you know body size depends on external conditions and if you think the the uh, hurricanes and tornadoes is the best way to measure the impact of global warming 
uh, it's it, probably not as accurate as insect size. So it, it's probably true that I really have been seeing a, a real change, not just um, uh, uh, not just a bias. Though that I admit is highly possible because I think about this all day long. These these insects may always have been this small, and I just never noticed it. Habitat it gets severely degraded uh, as the, the climate adjusts. And uh, the, the, the changes basically result in a scarcity of resources, whether that be water or uh, other creatures down the food chain, as things start to, to uh, lose their habitat the the whole, whole house of cards starts to come down in segments think about it uh, for the longest time i used to i used to think well if you've got an area where this this particular insect thrives and because of the nature of insects they interbreed with one another and you have a robust evolving population because there's lots of baby insects being made that is the way populations grow and and uh, uh, regulate themselves but then you put a road in that road you know is six lanes and it's got loads of traffic on it and it, it it cuts the the area in half now i used to think well it's a tiny strip of land that that runs through this this area that is not available for insects to be on that's not the case. That's not the problem. You have just split in two, two populations that were optimized for the size of the population. Now you've made two populations that don't interbreed because the ones that try to cross the road don't make it. So you end up limiting the, the availability for, for genetic um, uh, intermingling uh, and for, for a healthy uh, um, uh, evolutionary process to take place. And instead, you end up with unhealthy, smaller populations that simply lack the biomass to keep going forward. And being an evolving species is like being on an escalator, a moving staircase, where you're moving up while that moving staircase is moving down. You can't keep up. Once that starts to happen, you have to move faster and faster to keep going up. And any pause at all, and you start going down again. And that's what happens when you split these populations. They're already having a hard time dealing with, with the climate and the sudden change in their own food, food availability. And then they get split by a housing development or a shopping mall or an airport. And suddenly when that happens... They, they can no longer continue and they become extinct. Insects are becoming extinct at a rate now that is both accelerating and greater than it has been in 50 million years. That is alarming. Uh, the, the number of insect species that are going extinct every day is shocking. And uh, it is very much a matter of that there is going to be a point beyond which we can't pause uh, or stop the damage and gain back the losses and that is not as far down the road as people want to think so um, chemical pollution is something that we've been doing uh, professionally as a civilization since day one and we continue to do it with little or no regard for the for the long term impact of dumping plastics and and insecticides and uh, and uh, 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 what am I trying to say fluorinated hydrocarbons in in the air. All of the things that we're doing all have an incremental impact, and they don't go away. They don't go away quick quickly enough. Uh, for, for us to just stop and hope everything will get better. We have to do some positive things to turn this around, uh, or there, there will be um, uh, no, no uh, planet for us to live on. It's not going to get me. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> I'll be out of here.
let me know how it goes. Overexploitation, not so much in the insect trade that we deal with, but the insect trade uh, for making animal feed and stuff like that is a big problem uh, because uh, when they're collecting from uh, the environment, they're collecting large amounts of biomass. And um, yeah, that, it, uh, it certainly leads to um, the, the harvesting of the larger bugs, basically, which is why we're seeing so many smaller, unhealthy ones. Um, I mentioned that there's an observer's bias here uh, in anything I say because it's hard to be in, you know, involved in this in any way at all and not look at it through those glasses. It's hard for me to step aside from my own interest in this and, and look at it completely objectively. Uh, but that's why we need to pay attention to things like forums and other groups that, that take this stuff deadly seriously. So um, the, the, one of the reasons, by the way, that, that we buy insects one of the reasons i buy insects i won't speak for you i'll speak for myself is because i like colorful uh, unusual uh, insects that i don't see around here it thrills me to photograph them uh, some of them are on the the wall behind me they they're not native here um, and i am feeling less and less comfortable um, photographing them uh, even though you know, it's, it's the argument is that you know one person harvesting a bee or two a year is not going to impact you know the the the, the world's um, uh, uh, ecological health. Well, that's just not really true. It's it is going to just not in a particularly big way. But I can't uh, not take you know take responsibility for what part I do have in it. So that's changing for me. Um, uh, you, it, it, it's there's there's a lot that goes into it. Um, uh, I still I still believe that the net good is is way way outweighs the the impact to the negative. But I have to have to think about it from all angles. Not the subject for today. Um, I do want to talk for the next little bit, just just briefly about the the uh, the uh, the insect annihilation. That's what they're calling it. it it's the the insect part of this uh, Anthropocene extinction that we're in now, the, the one that's uh, uh, likely caused by, by us and our, our activities. Uh, the, the way it's specifically impacting insects is very interesting. And uh, we've talked about it in bits and pieces, but I want to kind of pull it all together and let you know what these, these things are facing. Uh, they are the most numerous uh, um, uh, animals um, in uh, animals now I'm saying not uh, we're not including things like bacteria uh, on the planet and uh, they make up a crucial link in in the food chain but if you rule out things like meteorite strikes and exploding mountains and volcanoes of lava and all that wiping out the the, the globe we're left with the kind of slow burn stuff I've been talking about. And what that results in for, for the bugs is, is habit destruction already covered. And remember, it's, it's not just the obvious things. It's also stuff that you don't necessarily see, like mining, uh, that, can, that can have a lot to do with the, the stability of the environment for these delicate creatures. Climate change, I think we've, we've talked about as much as we can. The change continues apace, um, and until we do something to turn it around, either invent some technology to do it or do it the, the old-fashioned way by lessening our carbon footprint, it's going to continue, and the impact will continue to rise. So it's a known. Pollution the same way. Um, Over-exploitation is one thing that we can, uh, that we can uh, do something about. But there isn't a great will for that because when it comes down to um, eating or uh, uh, paying attention to your environment, most people are going to choose to eat, and I understand that. Uh, I like to eat um, occasionally, so it, it's the 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 
exploitation that we can probably do something about exploiting wildlife for for uh, pets or souvenirs that type of thing we can probably find the will to stamp that kind of thing out but that's not really the problem it's much bigger than that it's an industrial size problem um, one thing i haven't mentioned is uh, we we're very sophisticated when it comes to how we interact with our environment and something that we've been doing for for decades is engineering situations in which invasive species are brought into an environment to to uh, control a population of pest bugs let's say let's say that that uh, uh, bug a is brought in from from vietnam because it loves our climate here and uh, it loves to eat japanese beetles item b it also turns out we didn't realize this but once it got here it has a a, a real penchant for for munching on uh, mayflies and uh, 10 other insects and all of a sudden they're all eaten they're all gone because these uh, the, these uh, um, uh, predators uh, can become unchallenged in the new environment and they just go crazy that's in fact how the japanese beetle problem got started um, so we we've been doing this a lot and um, every time we do it it comes with with a, a price tag that that wasn't anticipated so think about that the um, insects are probably the group of animals most impacted at this stage uh, by the changes that i've been describing uh, though other other uh, Populations are no different. I mean, once you split them up, they, um, they're, they're going to start to fall apart. But um, this, is a, this is a global problem. This is not a problem uh, in, in equatorial um, uh, South America and, and uh, the Far East. This is a problem for us too. This is a problem every corner of the planet has to deal with. Um, areas that, that are generally speaking incredibly biodiverse they're the really rich rich places like the amazon basin they are more sensitive to a lot of these impacts than other places and that loss of diversity is what we're seeing now it's where a lot of these species are going extinct um, the rate of species loss is estimated to be something like a hundred times higher uh, than it has averaged over the past uh, 10 million years and it's accelerating yeah so how do we what do we do what can we possibly do does me cancelling my order with insect trade eu change this probably not uh, but there are things that we can do in keeping habitats protected that just are our common sense and it, it's not it's not a tree hugging kind of uh, uh, motive it's a survival motive um, we we are on borrowed time and we're still spending it as fast as we can we've got to protect these habitats so that the the base of the pyramid that we form the very apex of stays healthy if that the bottom part of our food pyramid and our, our biologic pyramid starts to crumble yeah we don't we don't just stay up at the top hovering in midair we we, we have nothing to eat and uh, it all gets worse so anyway um uh, you know we've got to find ways to use land more more uh, carefully to to raise animals in addition to raising them more humanely uh, raising them in a, in a healthier uh, and more productive way with the land that we have available lots of companies lots of organizations i should say are working on this uh, uh, and uh, there is progress there really is it's not as bleak as it sounds but it is pretty damn bleak anyway i mean a lot more of us need to be concerned about it um there there is uh there are many many resources out there that are local as well as regional and national and international that are dealing with this and maybe the the, the one thing that that you could do 
uh, is is find one or might maybe two of those organizations and just read their stuff read about this what i'm telling you about today and see if see if what you learn uh, jives with this and if it does maybe mention it to somebody else i think we have to if um, you know if our great grandchildren are going to have a place to live and if uh, if elon uh, you know hasn't restored our shuttle service to mars or whatever by then yeah we're, we're going to need this planet so we we probably should do something about it now i hope i'm not uh, I, I hope i hope i'm not putting people off i know this this is a photography channel and i'm dead serious about my photography i love it uh, and everything about it and this is one of those things that, that I don't like to talk about because I don't like making people feel bad. Um, but uh, sometimes you have to. And um, uh, that's why I'm, I'm risking it today. But we do have as individuals and we as a community of individuals, we can do things about it. We can, we can pay attention to it. We could have our photo competition look at one or, or two of these issues and make it a theme. There are things that we could do that will raise the awareness of the people around us in our families, our circle of friends, our photography club, whatever. And we should think about it and, and talk about it because, you know, the, the beautiful, intricate, dizzying uh, array of life that we have just out there waiting for us to come out there with a, a camera and a macro lens is teetering on the edge. And uh, we need to pay attention to them. All right. Uh, nobody can talk about the, the, the sixth extinction without at least thinking, well, what's the timeline on this? When's it, when's it all, when does the balloon go up? Well, th there, it's just impossible to say because there are more moving parts to, to this than, than you could possibly imagine. Uh, but... There are things known as ecological uh, threshold collapses. These are very important bellwethers that, that as, as a particular ecosystem, say a coral reef collapses under the pressure of the warm ocean, that gives us a, a, a way to measure the rate at which these things are changing. And uh, the deforestation in the Amazon is another example of, of, um, <laughs> of, of how swiftly, once that key brick is pulled out of the bottom, the whole lot comes down. It takes centuries to prime the pump. And then it takes a couple of events, maybe over the course of a number of days, to bring the whole thing down. So... We've got, to be, we've got to find ways to, to turn it around and we've got to be involved in it. We, we you and me, we have to be part of the, the solution. Um, I am going to, uh, uh, to, to stop there. My notes go on, but they get a little grim. <laughs> they get grimmer than that. And, um, you know, the, the, the trick to, to good ad advocacy for something like this um, is to is to let everybody that will listen to you know that there's there's a problem, but not take it so far that it's a it becomes a hopeless problem. That doesn't serve any purpose. Uh, we have a, a clear job as as um, insect photographers, even as non insect photographers, Joseph. We have a job, uh, and our job is to show the world how incredible our planet is. We can do that. That's what we do. And that's, that's really the message I wanted to leave you with. If, if the only way that you can really do that is by photographing insects that you source from the Netherlands, then source them from the Netherlands. Do what you do um, and, and, and do it well. Uh, th this is not a, a, a time to, to give up, uh, but it's a time to, 
to focus on why we're doing it. We do it to celebrate the planet. We do it to celebrate the, the amazing stuff that lives with us here. Uh, and not many people do it, so we have to do it well. And um, uh, yeah, so let's make it a celebration and let's, let's get out there this afternoon. I'm not getting out there this afternoon because global warming has got a thunderstorm coming. Uh, but, um, and I have to do my taxes, which this does not address. Any of this does not address my taxes. So um, let's do that. Let, let's just redouble our efforts. Let, don't worry about the, the I'm going to give you a couple of recommendations about smart buying. But if that's the, if that's where you're most comfortable, then then do that. But just make sure you take good pictures and don't ever kill an insect that you don't photograph. OK. Or try not to. And um, uh, here's, here's the, the useful tip that you can take with you. Join a forum, uh, an entomology forum, a university forum, any, anywhere where people are buying and working with insects regularly and make a couple of friends there and just ask them where they're buying their insects, where are they getting them. Just build a, a small network and you will find some remarkable information. There are outlets that I didn't even know about, and I did not join any of these um, the, the first time around. Um, I should have done. It was an oversight. But there are, I will give more practical information as I learn more, but uh, there are ways for us to source insects smartly, safely, more cheaply, and get better specimens. And, uh, and I will leave it there. We've just got a few minutes and I'm sure there are some comments and um, possibly some complaints. So let me see what we've uh, got in the uh, chat. Um, let me see. Yeah, uh, the, in the box, uh, there was a guess that it could be um, Optiflex, Novaflex's new lighting system. If it is, it's the heaviest lighting system you want me to open it in the last two minutes? What if it is a body? <laughs> uh, seriously, I don't know. I, uh, that is a good point, though. Shall I open it? I'll wait and see. A new XYZ table. I didn't order one. Uh, and if I did, I would not have ordered one that, that size because I wouldn't know where to put it. I do need to order a lab lifter, though. Mine, mine has now given up the ghost. I've gone through two of them in, in five years. They're just, they're worn out. Um, it could well be, it could well be the lighting. If it is, all bets are off. I'm not doing my taxes this year. I won't get to it. I'll just have to tell the IRS, I'm sorry. I got busy. So, um, let me see. It sounds like some people are, are agreeing, which is good. Yeah, yeah. Red squirrels. You guys are so bright. You know that. Well, you must know that because you don't come here to listen to me. You come here to meet with your other bright friends, which is what this is all about anyway. Uh, but you are. You're very, very bright. I, I figured if there was a, a group of people that I could risk... Um, sticking my neck out with it would be this group because I think you un understand probably just how how important this is but um, open the box says Joseph I'm going to go get it chat amongst yourselves you'll hear me dragging something that man carried this across my garden. I don't know which end to open. Does it matter? Okay. It's almost... There it is. <laughs> you thought I was joking. I wasn't joking. It's it's bigger than I am. Uh, 
Does anybody have plans for the weekend? Pla going to do anything fun? Okay, there's a, a red label right inside the box that says Danger Glass. Danger Glass. And it's in German. And I can't lift it. I, I'm serious. Look. Shall I just keep opening boxes? It's like nesting dolls. This is it. This is the lighting system. I am so excited. I hope it's not a helium balloon because I think I may have just punctured it. My goodness, this thing is wrapped up. I'm, I'm not, oh, it's got metal staples in the box. I'm gonna cut one side of the box off. If you, um, if you need to go back to work or back to sleep or anything, you, can, you don't have to stick around for this. This is, uh, this is optional. I'm through talking. I just want to wish everybody a, a happy and peaceful weekend. And I hope you'll come visit on Tuesday and Thursday next week. And then I'll say goodbye um, while I go abroad for a little bit. And um, yeah, and if you want to stick around now, you'll get the first look. Literally, this is a real unboxing because I have no idea what I'm going to find. Other than... It's one big box inside the... Oh, I forgot, I missed one side. So who was here today? Was Susan here? Susan? I'm supposed, I'm supposed to be calling you in a minute. But I think it may have to wait just a bit. All right, okay, that's one box off. And what's inside? Another box the same size. All right, plan B, I'm gonna open it on its side. It doesn't have a side. More knife work. What does Nicht fallen lassen mean? Uh, is Ingolf there? Does that mean do not use a, a blade to open this box or? Ugh. It says, don't drop. Well, I wasn't, wasn't planning on it. We're in. Bloody hell. Oh, jeez, so, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that on the, on the live thing. Oh my goodness, gracious me. That's it. One suitcase. Ugh. That suitcase weighs as much as a Volkswagen. And it's uh, a Pelican. I'm never going to be able to afford to mail this back to them. I'll deal with that later. I would put it on my lap and show it being open, but oh, you know what? I forgot about that, the camera. Let's see if that works. 
<laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Okay. It has catches all around it. I don't know. Oh, there we are. Stay in touch for more. Licht auf den Punkt. It's a light punk. That's what the 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 card says. Octolux. Oh my goodness. Oh, this is first class. Oh boy, that is really nice. And here it is the, the focusable light source. Well, I should probably read about this before I assemble it. But what would be the fun of that, eh? It's on a goniometer. Maybe more than one axis. It has... Oh, the, the power comes from Germany because it has a transatlantic cable. Uh, three cables. You guys... Oh, wow, look at this. These are very fancy looking lenses. This is going to, this is going to be an adventure. And I am going to, uh, I'm going to pause the unboxing and then, um, Record this uh, for a uh, proper look. Well, let me show you the power supply, the, the light maker. That was what weighed all the, that's the weight right there. Optilux Solace. What a beautiful, beautiful piece of engineering that is. All right, guys, <laughs> I've got my work cut out for me. Let me switch back to say goodbye. Oh, wow. What a day. How about that? We got all serious and then um, this lifted the, the spirits there at the last minute. Everybody, have a great weekend. And uh, you know where I'm going to be. Right here. Doing this. And uh, uh, it'll give me this will give me a couple of weeks to, to get a lot of testing done before we talk about it. But... Uh, Expect a, an interim report next time I talk to you. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. And um, Angie, I tried that already, the insect swap thing. It, it, it turned out to be very expensive. Um, yeah, I'll, t I'll tell you the story about it later. But let me, uh, let me get to work on the Optilux, and I will uh, speak to you guys soon. Take care. Stay safe and be well, and uh, I'll see you on Tuesday or Saturday. Saturday. I'll see you on Saturday. Good day. And thank you so much, as always, to Alistair and Amy and Bud for everything you do and for everybody that does anything for this channel. Thank you. Thanks for keeping it going. All right. Catch you later.